Today we're going to talk with our new friend, Michael Allison. He is a polyvagal theory-based educator and coach helping athletes in a variety of sports optimize their resilience and performance by meeting their nervous system where it is and perhaps either calming it down or even better, transporting it into the play zone. Let's talk about the neuroscience of safety, connection, and play with Michael Allison. So hopefully by the end of today, I would like to come away with some tools that we can use for understanding the state of our nervous system and also um, tools for how to change and move through that nervous system. That might be a big ask, but that's, that's my hope. So before we um, go there, though, can you give us a, a kind of overview of how our nervous system works? I know it's a huge question, but um, for the purpose of later on um, getting these tools, can you sure. yeah, kind of give us an overview of that? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be succinct and clear. It is a, it is a big question, but yeah. in, in practically speaking terms, our nervous system, which is operating beneath conscious control, right? How that is regulating our internal environment, meaning our organs, our bodily systems. However, that's regulating that internal environment moment to moment to moment, that impacts how we experience the world. That influences how we think, the emotions we feel, uh, maybe even the patterns and habits that we're drawn to. And then really importantly, it changes how we act and react and interact with one another. So it's going on beneath the surface but what we, what I would, in our talk, if I refer to feelings, what that really is, is that's us becoming aware of consciously of what's going on internally. So how we feel or how we don't feel plays a role in how we experience what it's like to be us in this world, moment to moment to moment. Are there ways to consciously, to gain consciousness over um these feelings, this, this nervous system of ours? What are some of the ways that you train people to um, first just gain that consciousness? Well, yeah, so, so my go-to phrase is let's meet the body where it is, wherever that is. There's no right, there's no wrong. And so what does that mean? It means can I, in a, in a, just to take a snapshot of how am I breathing? If I'm speaking... What's the tone and pace and modulation of my voice? Can I feel any muscle tension anywhere? Can I even, for me, I can feel my heart rate. So can I become aware of my heart rate? In addition to that, I might also check in what emotions am I feeling or what thoughts are popping into my head or what is my mood or my attitude and my outlook in this moment. And all of those attributes of this current experience are really just inf they're bits of information that are percolating up from really what's going on internally subconsciously so that's the first part to your question is how do we become aware of this nervous system this mysterious automatic nervous system that's doing all of these things for us without our conscious control and thankfully it does otherwise we wouldn't be able to breathe Right? We wouldn't be able to even speak. We wouldn't be able to do all these things. So first part is just what are those attributes that we can become aware of? And for me, it's things in the body, heart rate, breathing, posture, muscle tension. Uh, if you're speaking tone of voice, how you're moving, and then those emotions and those thoughts or even patterns of behavior that you start engaging in. And so that's the first part, meeting the body where it is. And then it isn't even so much about now I'm going to regain conscious control of my body. For me, the first part is how do I relate to that? How do I relate to what's actually happening? Mm -hmm. Because it's happening for good reason, yeah. right? There, there's a multitude of reasons. There's, we're reading subconsciously just an immense amount of information through our sensory information coming in, through we're reading each other, 
our own facial expressions and our movement and our gestures, our voice. And then we're also reading what's going on inside already. Like how are my organs being optimized or not at this moment? So we're reading all of this information. And for me, it isn't about like, okay, now I'm going to regain control of my physiology and I'm going to regain control of my nervous system. It's about how do I first just meet it where it is? And then how do I relate to that in a way that might be helpful, right? That might help realign my breathing and my muscle tension and my tone of voice to actually support my intentions right now, which would be to actually help people understand this, right? So that's how I look at it is here's what's happening. And now how do I relate to that internal experience in a way that might be helpful? And like you mentioned, the nervous system is going to be doing what it's doing regardless in the background. So why, why would we even really need to become aware of and relate to our body and see it, meet it where it is or whatever? Right. Because it's going to do it anyway. It's going to do it anyway. So why do we need it? Why do we need to know? Why do we got to bring it to consciousness? To me, that, that's the reason. That's right. To me, that is the reason. That's the, the, the question is the answer. Is yeah. It's going to do it anyway which if I can become aware of it and help it at times to realign more with my goals or my values or how I want to show up in the world, I give myself some agency, right? I give myself an opportunity to actually slow things down and react in a way that aligns better with my heartfelt intentions. So to me, it gives that chance, that opportunity. Some might call it free will, that's the only way from my perspective, we actually have a moment to have choice because otherwise we could be moving through the world reacting. Just let the nervous system is fully doing its thing and we're spiraling in just, just reaction, just reacting. And so to me, it's an opportunity to have some intention, to have some realignment to what's really important to me and to you. Yeah. And throughout the day, throughout our lives, and it's different for each each person. Um, we might get stuck in certain parts of the nervous mm-hmm. system. I guess this, this is getting into polyvagal theory now. Um, mm-hmm. But how how do you how do you, how do you do this differently for someone who's say down here in this um, shutdown state, uh, depression, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, versus this mm-hmm. sympathetic uh, fight flight sure. mode, uh, stress energy. Uh, versus someone who already has sort of this um, kind of control over their system and they're, they're, and they're safe and social. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are the different sort of techniques uh, between these people? Yeah. Maybe, maybe we should step back in, and you should get into polyvagal theory perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. And just talk about, so, so first and foremost, related to that question, polyvagal theory would say that we're on this enduring quest to actually feel safe right? Because feeling safe or at ease and grounded and not like you were describing, not withdrawn and checked out or not highly mobilized and ready to attack and fight, feeling at ease and connected and present and grounded is really reflecting that our nervous system is regulating our organs in a way that's more homeostatic, in a way that's supporting more health and growth and recovery and restoration. So that is our enduring lifelong quest. However, We live in a world that has a lot of challenge, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of competition, right? A lot of evaluation, a lot of chaos and change. And all of those features in this environment that we all live in, those are interpreted by our nervous system as risk, as danger, as threat. And when we're interpreting that, again, subconsciously, as risk and danger and challenge, what we will tend to do first based on polyvagal theory is we will mobilize. We will, we will divert resources away from supporting our homeostasis and our health and our growth. And we're going to put those resources again, subconsciously toward mobilizing metabolic output. So we can either fight and attack, or we can run away and protect and defend. Okay. So that was one state you were describing. So if someone is sort of coming to see me and that's where they tend to reside in in this body that in a way doesn't trust 
that it's actually safe to feel safe and calm, but now I'll actually trust that it's actually safer to be on guard and ready to fight or ready to run. The approach might be different a little bit than the, in the other case, which we'll get to, and then we can talk about the approach. But the common approach or the common thread here is that no matter how a body is presenting, no matter when we meet our body where it is, if it is not feeling safe and at ease and connected, it's feeling more in a threat-oriented state, we need to do whatever we can to help that body. If it's actually safe in the, in the environment, in the interaction, if it's actually safe, we have to actually help that body find and to feel and to absorb what cues are available that are safe and reassuring and help actually ground the body. Okay. And we'll get more into that. So then, then the other part, so say we've been fighting or we've been running away from, which is very metabolically costly. We can't do that forever. We just can't. So if we exhaust our metabolic resource, we exhaust our energy supplies, basically, or if that interaction or that environment is overwhelming and we interpret subconsciously that it's actually even life-threatening in its own way, then we go to that more primitive, more ancient response, which is that shutting down, which you described, that withdrawal, either numbing, dissociating, or a full collapse and shutdown, where our nervous system is now cueing and saying, hey, let's conserve and preserve everything we have left. Let's slow down the heart rate. Let's reduce blood pressure. Let's lower metabolic output and let's actually hunker down and just survive through preservation. Okay. So for some of us, we're kind of living in bodies that are actually moving between those two defensive threat oriented states where we're mobilized for a while and we're fighting or we're anxious. You know, we, we live in a world that talks about anxiety and that's just that physiology that's mobilized and ready prepared, hypervigilant. But because that's metabolically costly, then we toggle and we move into this more shutting down, conserving. So you might be, you might know in yourself or in someone you know where they're highly mobilized, super busy, always getting things done, and then they collapse on the weekend or once a month. And so that's that body that's moving back and forth. So again, the first part is let's just become aware Let's meet the body where it is without judgment, without evaluation, and just see it for what it is. And now what can we actually do with our own body, our own nervous system, that that nervous system welcomes as safe, as reassuring, as grounding, as calming, as, and most importantly, as connecting, as connecting, right? The most powerful resource in all of these cases is safe and trusting and playful relationships. That's the most powerful resource. Like it seems deep down, we, like you said, we just want to feel safe in this world and ourselves with each other. And as social mammals, that, um, that means connected with each other. Yes. How, how do we, I, I guess let's get into some of the actual tools. Um, mm -hmm. oftentimes when I ask this question, people will say, um, I can't give you the tools. It depends on the person. Uh, so that might be the answer, but I, I do believe there are things we could do with, um, with breath, with sound. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Perhaps eye movements, um, different things yeah. um, that generally should calm our system down and bring us to a, um, at least temporary um, state of safety. Um, what are your ideas on that? Great. Yeah. So let, let's separate it out though. So okay. let's say, so let's go back to your earlier question. So yeah. if, if you're someone that is in a highly mobilized, more defense oriented body, but it's mobilized, you're vigilant, right? You're on guard. Then calming mechanisms might, might be a good choice, right? Because we're going to contain that sympathetic energy and we're going to maybe soothe it. That's one approach. So having resources that are calming, like you were talking about through breath, right? At the same time, we could also just take that mobilized energy and we could contain it with safety and connection, social connection, 
and actually turn it into play. So we're not concerned about calming it as much as we're just concerned now with containing it in a way that it's no longer in an environment that feels threatening, but it's actually in an environment with social relationships that you might trust. And we call it play or we call it dance, right? It could be anything like that. So we don't, the first thing I wanted to articulate is we don't necessarily have to always calm it down if it's mobilized. We can actually contain it and turn it into just play. And that can be wonderful, right? And then through that playful experience, whether it's dance, whether it's playing a sport, whether it's playing music in a band, or whether it's even singing like in a choir, all of those things to me are play because they're mobilized, but there's social connection and there's engagement and there's cueing off each other. There's body language, there's expression, there's listening to others. And all of that now is play. And then as you do that, what you're really doing is you're building this resilience in your nervous system. And then through that process, you're also expending some of that metabolic energy and you might naturally start to calm, right? You might actually begin to feel more at ease, closer to stillness, but you did it through a more creative way that actually met your body where it was. Instead of saying, I'm going to force you body to calm because a lot of bodies are going to resist that. So that's, that's the way I would actually approach a mobilized body is I would start trying to find ways to play with that. And then through that play, gradually slowing it down to where it can trust that it's safe to be still. Maybe. Okay, let's go full on into this play stuff. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what is play from um, the perspective of the nervous system or um, physiologically speaking? Yeah. So play is a combination. So since we're tapping into polyvagal theory, so play is a combination of this, having the social engagement system, which is our capacity to use our voice and our facial expression and to extract the human voice from background sounds through our ears while engaged with mobilization. So while having that sympathetic nervous system access to that and different levels of that, simultaneously having this social engagement system online. So what that does is it technically it's changing the vagal regulation of your heart and your breathing. It's actually using what is simply referred to as the vagal break, the breaking mechanism on the heart, the cardio inhibitory fibers that slow down the heart. And then when they release the heart speeds up. And so play is this interactive reciprocal synchronous spontaneous interaction with others that involves different levels of mobilization and calming mobilization and calming. And what's really cool about play is there will be ruptures, right? Like you're playing a sport and somebody throws an elbow and all of a sudden your trust is violated. You're actually moving into sympathetic, but they look at you and they're like, Hey, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean it. And now they, their facial cues calmed you back down. So what's really happening in play is you're having this challenge to the nervous system that it's having to mobilize and kind of go close to fight or flight and yet it has a little control so it calms it and then you're moving back and forth and that is a recipe for a resilient nervous system it's beautiful and the facial cues, oh, facial the, cues. the voice you're saying is that this is this is what's sort of keeping us in the play zone or yes into in the, in the play zone exactly yeah. because if if that same thing had happened and I looked at who elbowed me and they were just walking away. Like I didn't get that facial cue of we're okay. We're actually okay. Yeah. We're still together. I didn't do that. So that's huge. The body language, the facial cueing, the tone of voice, right? The modulations in the voice, yeah. the postures, the gestures, all of that. That's what makes team sports play. That's what makes it play by the way I'm defining play. So team sports would be where you and your teammates are doing that together. You're sending this, these cues back and forth of we're doing this together. We're a team and yet we're highly mobilized and you can even be fully sympathetic, but then you cue off your player, pulls that vagal break, and now you're into play and you're okay. You're not actually fighting. 
Yeah, and it's more fun to play than to compete. Um, That's right. I'm guessing it's that's right. You're probably also more successful. You're probably more likely to win, but I don't know. Um, well, are you? That well, that's my approach. That's what I call the play zone. Yeah, play zone to me is it's a different physiology than the fight physiology or the flight physiology. Play is a different physiology, and it is actually optimizing metabolic resource. It's more efficient. You're having higher levels of that heart rate variability, which would theoretically make your reaction time quicker. You also have access to higher brain structures that would provide for more creativity, problem solving, being able to actually execute your skill set, draw up on strategies. So play to me is a higher level of performance. But what you said is also really fascinating. Play, when we actually are in play, what that really means is we in that moment in our physiology, the way it's being regulated, we actually have enough vagal control that we feel comfortable. We feel safe. Competition, the way most of us compete, is actually grounded in a physiology that is not feeling as safe and comfortable. And, and we call it fear, right? We call it anger and aggression. We label it with an emotion, but underneath that emotion is actually a physiology that's slightly different than the physiology of play. And so there is that emotion of anger or the emotion of fear and worry, and it does impede on performance. But most people, because they live in bodies that actually don't trust that it's safe to feel safe and to feel free, there are some high-level players in any sport who, when they feel comfortable, that's the worst thing for them. So they live in bodies that actually don't trust it's safe to feel safe, whereas they live where they trust that it's safer to be on guard. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so most people crave competition. And when they say competition, they mean fight, fighting for the prize, fighting. It's a, it's a battle because they reside in bodies that actually are more grounded in threat and have this physiology that is more threat oriented versus safe homeostasis. Yeah. It's almost like they're more comfortable um, with that kind of high, because even that, that competition, it does get you high in a certain way. It's almost like a amphetamine or cocaine or something like that. And then sure. when you're, I don't want to compare it to drugs exactly, but you know, the, the, but they like it. They like how it feels. Um, you, there are people who enjoy gambling and doing all kinds of things that I can't yeah. imagine enjoying, but they enjoy it. But there's this different kind of, um, happiness or feel good feeling um that you get when you're connecting with others and you feel safe um and it's a completely different high if you want to call it that um not that we're trying to get high but yeah we kind of we kind of are we want to feel good um you, you made a good point there too about the um the prefrontal cortex or the these higher brain structures shutting down yeah. when we don't feel safe um can you talk more about that because that's, that's that's fascinating yeah. yeah so so polyvagal theory in the way that i frame it and understand it is that we have these very primitive regulatory centers at the level of the brainstem. Okay. So think of it as an inverted triangle and the brainstem is the base of that triangle. And then up above our higher level thoughts and prefrontal cortex and the capacity to have emotions and critical thinking and problem solving and all of that are higher up. But what's going on at the base at that brainstem level either makes that available or limits access. So, what we're really trying to do if we want to optimize performance or optimize creativity or optimize critical thinking or optimize learning is we want to do whatever we can to help those regulatory centers at the brainstem that are actually regulating our internal environment through the vagal nerve. We want to help that interpret the environment around us, the internal environment and the relational environment as I'm okay, as this is a chance to actually be closer to homeostasis, not this is really scary and threatening and I'm, I'm, I need to be focused on survival. We want to get those regulatory centers optimizing the internal environment for the demands of the situation. No more, no less, and not grounded in threat, danger, all of that. Because that literally 
puts our resource toward that internal environment, trying to reestablish enough safety in that internal environment to change those regulatory centers to now say, free up, you can be creative. So that's what we're essentially doing in, in all situations, even when it's dangerous. So what I would try to teach from the standpoint of performance is let's just say you're a pitcher, okay? You're walking out onto the mound. It's the ninth inning. You've got to, you've got to close this game down. You're up by one run. It's a World Series. You're walking out there. Crowd is going nuts. There is danger. Okay, so your nervous system is reading everybody else's energy, whatever you want to call it. You're reading their muscle tension. You're hearing their tones of voices. You're seeing their posture. You're, you're sensing how they're breathing. The, you are being bombarded with all kinds of cues of evaluation and risk and danger from everybody in there. Now, there are some people supporting you and being like, yeah, you've got this. Yeah, you, you know, and, but it's all different, right? And you know, too, you're putting conscious stuff danger, too, because it's really important to you. You've spent your whole life for this moment. So you've got all these stories going on, which are also now sending cues in here, right? So this crowd sending cues into the ears and the eyes, the whole experience is sending all of that in. And then what happens is you walk out there and you notice your heart's pounding. You notice your hands are sweating, right? More than normal. So you grip the ball and it's like, wow, I this is really slippery. This is wait, I don't, what? And now you have, so now that's sending more information back into that brainstem. So that brainstem in that moment is like, this is really dangerous. And for some, it might be life threatening. Like it could be interpreted as this is life threatening. So now it's sending motor information, efferent information back down to the heart, the lungs, the whole in, internal environment. And it's saying, could be saying, get more mobilized because you've got to get out of here. Or it could be saying, this is over. <laughs> we need to slow everything down, right? So now you get this. And then as that's happening, you might have prior experiences, memories that you're aware of or that you aren't aware of, of prior success, hopefully, but you might have prior experiences of not doing what you would intend to execute failure, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I don't use the word failure, but you have prior experiences of things not playing out the way you had hoped. So now that bodily feeling is associated with a memory that isn't helpful. And now that pops into your head, which then sends another signal down. So now you've got this brainstem getting top down sensory information and inside information that says, this is really, really dangerous. And I just want to get out of here. So that's what, that's what an athlete or a performer is dealing with. And so when all of that is happening, as it should, that, that is a natural, physiological, biological response that we all share. That's what kept us alive. And at the same time, there are still cues in that surrounding environment within your own body, like you mentioned, breath where you put your attention, there are still opportunities for you to find some other cues that can help reconvince that brainstem that actually this isn't as dangerous as you're interpreting it to be. This isn't actually life-threatening. And sports psychology or performance psychology tended to always focus on positive thinking and change the psychology to change the physiology. And what I'm getting at is it's a both. It's a both and. But when that body gets going and spiraling and all of that, it's really hard to change the narrative and have that have an impact on the body. Yeah. You have to do some more body-based, some more the language that the actual primitive brainstem recognizes. And at the same time, not expecting the body to be in this positive state, this perfect state, and judging it for being... Uh, Beautiful. Because it naturally we kind of um, this is feeling that oh this fight flight energy that that kind of mm -hmm. stressed energy we we kind of view it as as negative for whatever reason but it's not necessarily yes. negative not right? necessarily negative good point yeah most people go stop happening stop this or I want to fix this why is this happening and I what we're saying is let's just meet the body where it is and that's actually a natural 
bodily reaction. It's reflexive, it's adaptive, and it's a survival response. And if you contain it, if you contain that, you can turn it into play. So if you can contain that with a trusted facial expression from another, you know, if you can, that's why like a high five with somebody too is so helpful, right? Like just, it's, it's that interaction and it's the cueing and that can turn that into play. That's the point. Yeah. You got it. And we, we can play, we can use all these principles, not just for sports, but we can, I'm guessing we can use them for um, relationships, dating, uh, business, yes. uh, whatever, right? Yes. Yeah. yes. Everything. Everything, right? So any challenge, whether that's trying to solve some conflict, conflict resolution, looking at it from the physiological states of those involved, whether that's a relationship and you're trying to have a difficult discussion about something, right? Can you go into that in a safe body that's actually promoting and exchanging cues of warmth and connection? Or are you going into it already mobilized and, and fight or are you detached and withdrawn if you're going into that relationship no matter if it's in the workplace or on a team you're broadcasting warning and threat and danger versus safety and connection and we're okay and that changes everything because they will have a reflexive reaction to how you're broadcasting yourself and at the same time that's happening to you so when you start seeing the world through this lens, it just gives you back where we started. It gives you an opportunity to have a little more agency in navigating all of this. And at the same time, less, less shame and blame and guilt and evaluation and criticism of, of yourself and others, right? You can see beneath the behaviors and beneath what we label as intentional and see that actually a lot of it's reaction, a lot of it's reflexive. But we're moving through this world in uh, this kind of competitive state a lot of times. And even though you're saying, oh, let's play, let's do this and that, um, when you find yourself in that moment of competition and you're not playing, but you want to play, um, you're just not having fun, how, how do you make the switch? Yeah, so the first part is, is no, noticing that, which you're saying you did. So you notice that, you know what, I'm not having fun with this and I'm actually – really, really aggressive, or I'm really trying to make something happen, or I'm just kind of hoping they say something or they do something and they make the mistake or whatever it is, right? Like there's all those different things that, that you could experience. And so for me, like my go-to things are is just recognizing that and then saying, okay, what in this moment is available to me that would speak a little more safety, a little more connection and see what happens. So it might be breath. That's just a go-to for me. It could be breath. And in regards to breath, if we want to calm down, we want to lengthen our exhale. Real simple. If we want to mobilize more, we want to lengthen our in-breath in relation to our exhale. Because those cardio inhibitory fibers that I was mentioning, that, that vagal breaking mechanism, that occurs on the exhale. So as we exhale, the vagal break slows down the heart rate. And as we inhale, the vagal break releases and allows our heart rate to speed up, allows a little more sympathetic to come online. So if, if I want to calm down because I'm feeling really aggressive and I'm noticing that my jaw is tight or my eyes are really squinting and I'm really focused and uh, making it happen, I might take a few slow, deliberate exhales that are longer than my inhales. And I like to add sound too. So if you can add some sound to that, because when you actually make sound and you use the larynx and pharynx, the nerves that regulate the larynx and pharynx are also vagal. They tie into the brainstem to the same nucleus that the vagus comes out of, the ventral vagal fiber. So by making sound, you're actually, again, sending the, the information to the brainstem that is more regulatory for the physiology. So you can make all kinds of different sounds and you can even make playful sounds and no one even needs to hear you. It can be quiet, but it just the sound, just a little bit of sound. Um, at the same time, relaxing the muscles in the face, relaxing the eyes, softening the gaze. Again, this is if I'm trying to calm down, right? This would be if I'm trying to sort of calm down. Also opening up and relaxing the posture, 
opening up the shoulders, relaxing the hands, the arms, relaxing muscle tension. All of those things would be real quick and very effective cues into the body, into that brainstem that say, if you needed to be fighting or you needed to be running away, you wouldn't actually be softening and opening up and slowing down your exhale. You see, so I'm, I'm actually sending conflicting information, but I'm doing it in a way that's respecting where the body is first, not overriding it. Just like, oh, okay, I can come alongside this and can, what can I, what will my body let me shift? How would one soften their gaze or um, perhaps even gain control over these eye muscles? I find that to be one of the hardest things. I, I sometimes see um, certain people, I have, a, I have a certain friend in mind, and he's, the way he moves his face, he's, it looks, he looks so safe, and he is so safe. He's such a loving person. And I, I, I want to be able to have such a face. But I, even though I know, about, I know about all this and I'm learning about this, I can't like, just change my eye muscles. I don't know how to access them. Uh, any ideas how to how to like yeah. get more of that it must be it must be a long long process <laughs> well part of it is your facial expressions emerge and reflect your current state right so it isn't that we're walking around trying to manipulate our face yeah it's it i don't i want to be clear that's not yeah. what i'm trying to get okay okay there. but because we broadcast our physiology, we broadcast how we feel. Remember yeah. how we feel is really a reflection of our physiology. So we broadcast how we feel through particularly what you were just talking about, the, the facial expression and primarily the upper face. Right. Okay. So I, I can manipulate my, my mouth, but I, I can't like consciously manipulate that part. Yeah. That's easier. So, yeah. so the mouth, the mouth uh, is more related to, like tension and fight. So what, what I'm, what I'm wondering, uh, b biting and screaming and yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that was more cue of danger. So that's where like it's, it, we signal more safety through the eyes, through the muscles around the eyes. Specifically, we signal more threat through the mouth, through the tension. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is so fascinating. Yeah. So I, I, Someone who has a lot of expression and exuberance in their eyes, like you're saying, what that would theoretically express, it would express that in that interaction, their physiology is being regulated through that brainstem in a way that's supporting homeostasis, like they're in a good place. Yeah. And so from that is emerging this eye expression and all of this facial expression and gesture. Do they also have a lot of prosody in their voice? What's their voice tone like? Yeah, yeah, it has prosody and it's, it's always smiling. Also, um, has very loving parents, and I, he feels very. He is actually safe, and he's always been safe. I think he feels very safe. So <laughs> it, it totally makes sense. It lines up, you know. Um, yeah. and I have other friends. They are, you know, in poverty or whatever, and uh, they're having troubles, and uh, maybe they they came from a poor family, and they're from a rough neighborhood, and their face is always a little bit like. Urgh. Yeah, and yeah. You go to some cultures. You go to certain countries. Some countries, like everyone's, has a certain face whether it's, yeah. you know, this or that. Yeah, absolutely. There are definitely cultural differences, but they're, the neural mechanisms are the same. So yeah. in the comforts of their own home, it's very likely that if they were to get excited, you would see it in exuberance in the eyes because those neural mechanisms are hardwired. You could culturally contain them in a way, but I would, I would guess that in the comforts of their own home and in privacy – they're showing the same facial expressions because there's the same neural mechanism. So as that, as that sympathetic comes on and that vagal break comes off, you will notice a change in the muscles around the eyes. You'll also, the nerves that regulate the middle ears that actually extract sound, those will actually yeah. soften. The more mobilized we get, the more those middle ear muscles soften so that we can detect more danger in background sound, right? So... So like you can see this playing out on the tennis court. If you ever watch professional tennis, a player, as they get more and more uncomfortable, more and more things aren't going their way. All of a sudden you notice they're noticing every little sound in the background there. And, and they're also noticing movements. 
things moving in the crowd become very distracting. That's me- that's how we're supposed to be because if it's dangerous, we want to be able to notice anything, right? We want to hear more background sound. We want to see more random movements. What's actually happening is it dilates the pupils. So we become more sensitive to light and movement. It's all meant to happen. So what you're describing with those who have had a lot more prior experience that we would consider very adverse and challenging, they may be in a more mobilized body, which would show that tension and it might show more tension in the eyes. Or if they're more kind of, if life's been overwhelming, they might have more of just a flat face. They might not have a lot of expression because they're more in that withdrawal place, right? And their tone of voice might be flat. Can you talk more about how our, how our own voice changes? Um, I know you mentioned how our hearing changes. We sort of cut out the, the mid-range. We get tuned into the danger sounds of these low frequencies and perhaps yeah. high frequencies as well. Perhaps, but yep. let's talk about the, um, the actual voice that you produce when you're feeling safe versus when you're feeling uh, in a state of danger. Yeah, so the, so the cool thing about polyvagal theory and all of this is that Social mammals in our evolution from the extinct ancient reptiles, we evolved this, this branch of the vagus that regulates our heart, regulates our lungs and our breathing, and then also regulates this other branch called the dorsal branch in a way that's healthy and homeostatic for all of the other organs. And that regulation in the brainstem area is actually interconnected to certain cranial nerves that regulate the striated muscles in our face and neck and head. And one of, and two of those, you know, we talked about, we talked about the eyes and we talked about the jaw. So the facial nerve and the trigeminal nerve, but then in addition, one of the other nerves regulates the larynx and pharynx. So what ends up happening is because we're social mammals, when we're born, we first need to be able to nurse to suck to swallow and to breathe and to coordinate that with how our heart is beating and our lungs are breathing because that's how we actually receive the nutrients and all of that so as mammals we have to be able to suck swallow and breathe and ultimately vocalize that we also need to be fed or need to be kept warm right so all of those nerves that allow us to suck swallow breathe vocalize connect in the brainstem to that vagal regulation of the physiology. It's a system. It's an interconnected system. So the voice, just like the eyes around here, reflexively broadcast to you, to me, to everyone, how my physiology is being regulated. And at the same time, I can change my voice, right? I can deliberately add some intonation. I can deliberately change how I'm modulating to send a signal back down that then changes my physiology in one way or the other, right? So it works in both ways, but it's mostly reflexive in that how we speak is really a reflection of what's going on internally. But we can regain some control of that deliberately to deliberately change our physiology. That's the beauty of voice also. But it was meant to signal to the other whether or not we were safe to approach and come close to and collaborate and connect, or if my voice was telling you I'm a threat and you need to get out, get out of here very quickly. So it's really fast. The auditory part is, very, is faster than the seeing. Wow, faster than the seeing. Yeah. Okay. How about the, the breath seems to be one of the main... Um, because it's kind of connected as well, the breath and the, and the voice, right? And breath, breath is connected, right? In order to speak, we have to exhale. So yeah. the breath piece, right? Because we're blowing air out. Also, in order to really have voice, to really have like a powerful voice, you would have to be able to push more air out, which would mean theoretically, you'd, you'd have to be able to move that diaphragm down more to pull more air in on your in-breath and then move it back up more on your out breath. So 
you theoretically to have a very powerful voice with a lot of capacity for modulation and intonation, you would enhance your breathing, right? The biomechanics of your breathing in order to sustain that. So that's where like singing and acting, stage performing. Playing. It's, it's other versions of playing basically, right? Yeah, exactly. That's where the, those things could become very powerful exercises to help build resilience in your nervous system like we talked about so you could you could for you what you were talking about with your eyes yeah you could you could take some acting classes which which would in a way acting can work in both ways you can you can help your body get in like if you're playing a role you can help your body get into that what that person's state would be Right. So you can help yourself kind of get into that state and you could call it an emotional state, physiological state, whatever you want to call it. But you're trying to get into the state that that actor would be in. And then from that will naturally emerge the tone of voice, the posture, the breath that that person would have. And then that as the audience, we would be like, oh, that is authentic. That is awesome. And we buy into it. Right. Yeah. At the same time, you could. Take that, what you want to play, that role, and you could practice modulating your voice, how that would be, practice your breath, practice your posture. You could do all of that sequentially and then tie it all together. And then that would create the state from which then that would also emerge. So you can do it either way. Does that make sense? So what I'm saying to you yeah, yeah, yeah. is because this isn't naturally happening for you. It kind of happened, not, not enough. Not quite. Yeah. Right. So you could theoretically, yeah. you could play with it in an acting environment where it's actually, it's, it's intentional and it's play. Yeah. So it's safe because uh -huh. it's not real, but it is. Right. <laughs> and then that could actually change the, that could actually integrate the neural mechanisms by which that changes your state from which now that naturally emerges. Yeah. You also mentioned earlier about this kind of distractibility when we are in this sort of, um, you can call it a state of stress or uh, activation of the sympathetic nervous system or fight, flight, whatever, danger. Um, we tend to, our pupils dilate and our heart starts racing and we actually start picking up on random sounds and, and visuals and stuff. And when you're, when you're talking about that, I, I started thinking about um, well, like ADHD, for example. Um, but not just ADHD. One uh, sort of core feature of that of that of people with with ADHD is is this distractibility and um, the sensitivity to yeah. um, to sounds and lights. It's not just ADHD. There's lots of other um, psychiatric disorders, uh, whatever you want to call them, where this is sensitivity to the environment. And we all have some sort of sensitivity to lights and sounds. I I, I do myself. Yeah. Um, I get quite annoyed by it or distracted by it. Um, it sounds like play might be a, a tool is various versions of play acting and sports and uh, whatever you want to do um, as a sort of a tool to decrease our distractibility and maybe perhaps um, help, help modulate some of these uh, uh, disorders or whatever you want to call them. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I couldn't agree more. I think, I think play is such a, an underrated, but very powerful resource because it's meeting the body where it is. So if like you were describing, if it's already hypervigilant and already yeah. like doing what it's supposed to do, it's, it's an adaptive response it, in that, in that internal environment, for whatever reason, whatever is causing it doesn't matter. But in that internal environment that feels unsafe, it's doing exactly what it should be doing, which is scanning, being, being able to move attention quickly to something else because you don't know what might be coming. So why play would be great is you're now not, you're not asking that to slow down. You're not asking that to change. You're just going to now sort of in a way contain it and move it and channel it ultimately toward it being to another, ultimately like doing the activity. But the, the, the key part is that they then start interacting with someone else. And then that will, in and of itself, start building the trust that will allow 
when not in play to actually not have to be so on guard, right? Because, so think of it like this, like we, in our biology, in our nervous system, we're on this quest to feel safe, but it isn't really safe to feel safe all alone. It's really safe to feel safe with a trusted other. Yeah. Right? Because like we want to really be sitting there with a trusted other so that we can actually let our guard down knowing they have our back, knowing they're with us. Right? So that's what I'm getting at. So through play, you can start to reconvince that nervous system that actually there is a trusted other and I'm playing with them. And then when we stop playing, I can actually chill because they're with me still, right? Like I, we can go to the bench together and I can actually feel really good because I just met, I let that metabolic output play out on the field. And now I'm sitting here with my buddy and I know he has my back and I can just whew, relax. That's what that, that to me is an example of what this life is about. That's what this is about. It's about finding that teammate who you trust so that you can let your guard down and you can actually come into homeostasis and you can be healthy and feel good, feel at ease. It makes sense why we laugh when we play and, and laughter and yeah. comedy itself is sort of like a, a version of play. Uh, we laugh when we see people playing and, and when we're playing. Totally. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so true. How about creativity? Uh, it seems like now the more we're talking about this, it, it, it seems like creativity and play are kind of tapped into the same network or they're very, there's some similarity going on here with this. Um, what, what is creativity and how can we use all this to, to become more creative through our sport, through our work, through our art, or, uh, for me, I guess with podcasting, I like writing. Um, yeah. How, what is creativity and, and how can we tap into it through me mechanisms like play? Yeah. I look at it in a similar way in that creativity can naturally emerge when we're in that physiological state that I would call the play zone. Yeah. So in order to be creative, we have to have some energy going, right? There has to be some metabolic output. Yeah. So there has to be a little bit of that engagement. Right. And at the same time, it, it optimally would be grounded in safety, in connection, in connection to self, in connection to what we're doing, in connection to other or the bigger picture, however you want to do it. But there's, Optimal creativity from the way I look at it emerges naturally out of a physiology that is safe and connected. And then through the act of whatever it is I'm doing, it's aligned with what's meaningful and purposeful for me. And even bigger than that, what helps me feel connected to myself and to others and to the bigger, bigger world, the bigger picture. That's how I look at creativity. I also think you can use creativity to help bring your physiology into a state that then supports more creativity. So I think it can be used even when you're not in that state from which it emerges. I think you can start tapping into those things that foster your creativity as a resource to shift your physiology into that state to support more creativity. So I think it goes both ways, um, but I do think you're, uh, you're spot on. To me, creativity is play. It's a very similar physiology. You may not be necessarily with another when you're embedded in that creative act, but you're connected to other. You're connected to something bigger or to the purpose of this is to share. The purpose of this is other. There's some connection yeah. to other in there. Right, because we tend to think of creativity uh, or creative acts as a sort of um, solitary thing oftentimes. So people do work together, but it's like this, something someone does in the room alone. But you're right, we are kind of, the end goal is to share it with others and to connect with others. And maybe, maybe. Yeah. We, in some way, there's some. Yeah. yeah, there's some connection or it could be that you're you're taking something that you've learned or m someone mentored you or you've embodied from someone else's work and and you're now you're synthesizing it in a way that now is your voice, right? So 
to me, there's some connection beyond just self. But it's interesting how you're how you're saying um, how to basically tap into the creative state. Uh, we normally we have these uh, ideas of how to do it. There's you know we've heard them all, uh, but you're saying we can do it through connection with others and feeling safe and and getting that kind of physiology yes. will bring us into a sort of creative state and um, yeah that makes it actually much more simpler because usually we, we see creativity as this mysterious thing but you just have to wait until the lightning strikes and the stars <laughs> were perfectly aligned and oh, I, I had this brilliant idea and now you're saying okay we could change our physiology and increase our odds of um bumping into there you go these shooting stars that's right that's how i look at this that's how i look at creativity that's how i look at performance we can increase our odds of that the probability of that emerging if we really start looking through this lens and start trying to help realign our physiology to support that intention to support our values to support what's really important to us because that's what i think we can do through this oh i, I had one other question uh, that i i wanted to ask before we, we go to it's not the most important one but um uh i'm someone who, who talks fast uh i'm not I'm, I'm trying to slow down now i i deliberately have to um learn how to slow down um and also uh, the pitch of my voice is probably higher than it should be given the size of my body uh it's of course it's connected to uh, many things that the tone of our voice the pitch the speed how, how does political theory and this this neurophysiology of play and all this stuff connect to the speed and the tone and all that stuff Stuff about our voice. I know we only have a few more minutes, and uh, sorry to spring this yeah. on you, but yeah, yeah. No, no, it's a it's a good question. And so again, it, it's it it is a reflection of how we feel, right? So it's a natural reflection of how we feel, and at the same time, just like we we're talking about with creativity, from my perspective, the the more that you relate to how you feel and find either places in your environment or spaces in your day or relationships in your life that help your own body, your own nervous system, move more into that sort of baseline of homeostasis, more of a less metabolic output, less of a sympathetic baseline and more of that calm baseline, yeah, yeah. then then what you're talking about will naturally change. The voice will slow down. The, the tone will, there will be more prosody. And at the same time, so that, that's, I think that will naturally emerge yeah. as, as you create more lifestyle practices and more relationships and more play in your life, now understanding what we talked about. Yeah. I think that can help you sort of look at what you're doing in your life as a way to how can I actually help kind of calm my brainstem mechanisms and ch try to get this internal environment a little more settled. Okay. That's, that's part one. Yeah. And then part two, I do think you really could deliberately play with that. Yeah. Cause I had the energy. I could use it, combine it right. with safety and, and, the and, and, and play. That's right. Yeah. And do it more. It could be, it could be improv. It could be, you yeah. know, it could be singing, it could be yeah. carrying, you know what I mean? Like it could be any, that could yeah. be acting. Like to me, if you have that and it's there, let's just, let's just play with it and then see what naturally emerges from it. So we, we just each need to find uh, even just one sort of activity that we love and we can do eye exercises and breathing exercises, but those get boring after a while. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to actually yes. um, play. So maybe for me, um, I, I did, uh, I did do improv a bit before and I, I really enjoyed that. Um, it's, um, it's, it's really fun. Um, but yeah, it might be improv, it might be acting, it might be playing sports. It might be just uh, going out and meeting more people and being playful. Totally. You got it. Um, singing. There's all kinds of things we can do. And you find the activity that sort of takes that sympathetic energy and, and, and somehow finds a safe place to use it. And then you play with it. And then your eyes start changing, your mouth, your voice starts changing. That's all these, right. I'm, I'm, I've been breaking yeah. it down. Like, how do I change my voice? How do I change my eyes? It's all one system, right? Yes. It all kind of starts changing when we start playing. Yeah, it's all one system. Yeah, I think the, what you just said, I think, is is so spot on. And I would just add one piece to just emphasize for your audience. Yeah. Is we we find that whatever that activity is, 
And if it's still being done by herself, ultimately we end up doing, we want to get that activity or we want to get to the place where it is with another. It is where we feel safe with another. That's the, that's the end goal. The end goal is that we get into this body that really does have a trusted teammate that really knows in its body that there is another, there is someone that supports us that we trust or that we can play with. So that's the only thing I want to add to that is that right. that is the end goal, but it might start with just playing by self. That's okay. Right. It might start with just being by self. Okay. Right. But ultimately my, my understanding of the nervous system and my understanding of this evolutionary change and polyvagal theory is that health and well-being and resilience absolutely are connected to sociality yeah are absolutely the same neural mechanisms that support our health and well-being support our connection and our capacity to collaborate and connect with each other and so that part is vital and if it's and if it's only done through play awesome that's okay let's just play with it so but that's all i wanted to say but also understanding that understanding that we don't have to jump straight into uh, football no. or something. We can be playing solitaire and then now we start playing a two player card Absolutely. game and then we start playing a little tennis That's and right. you kind of right. go where you don't, you push yourself a little bit, but you don't push yourself too hard into the social Stretch. realm because the social realm is a scary, dangerous place. That's why you've been hiding yeah. away and, and whatever. That's right. For a good reason. Right. So you don't just go straight into the deep of the ocean. <laughs> That's right. No, exactly. Exactly. Thanks for, sh- thanks for expressing that. Good stuff. So what the basic point is let's um, let's take that energy that we have or, or don't have and combine that with a, a safe uh, a crowd of people or a single other person. Uh, let's play with each other. And I guess through that, we can start to regulate our nervous system and feel better and um, be healthier. Um, everything basically we're looking for, probably get better relationships, make more money, yeah. but all, all that. I'm not, it's not a money podcast, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, this is great. This is great <laughs> stuff. Um, we, play we awesome we do as kids we 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 forget about it um but uh and so many ways to play okay so many um i'm excited so i'm gonna i'm gonna play today what are you gonna do today Uh, just play just play okay uh yeah if people want to connect with you tell us yeah your website or whatever you got so appropriately it's theplayzone.com there's the place to go the the theplayzone.com awesome thank you so much michael you're welcome